what we want to keep doing is iterating on um, some end-to-end -end, uh, scenarios. The first release, major release of this, um, we sh people should be able to um, uh, run the hello world of cryptocurrency, which is to create a wallet, uh, create a, a token contract, and then um, and then push uh, tokens uh, across the network um, through that wallet. I think that's sort of the the sort of the very very bare bones kind of experience. Each of the sort of interim milestones have to do with releasing pieces of that. Now let me just check in with you, Ed. Is that is that still kind of our common understanding? Yeah, absolutely. Just a couple additional things. Um, you know, the, the, the work breakdown structure that um, I, I drafted and we've been talking about has a lot of milestones in there that might be internal builds, right, but might, might not be packaged such that it's, you know, we're going to recommend adoption by a lot of people or tinkering by a lot of people. Um, but you know, sort of in a in a more you know agile kind of sprint way or or large sprints, because <laughs> but yeah, the the bits will always be open source and available to play, but they might not have a a, a real nice nice pretty bow on it uh, on achievement of one of these particular milestones. But hopefully, yeah, yeah, exactly. And and I think that really has to do with with the the, um, the, the fact that software of this level of complexity has to be iterative, yeah. right? If we just went dark for the next 12 months, then I think people would get kind of nervous and squirrely and, 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 or they just forget about us. <laughs> yeah, so um, certainly the, the, the earlier milestones are gonna be easier for people that have uh, you know, a lot of technical chops and ability to, to you know, figure out an install when the install's not perfectly well documented and turnkey. <laughs> but then as time, as time goes on, there'll be more and more uh, friendly for for a broader set of developers. That, that, that's exactly right. De developers until finally, you know, uh, at, the, at that first major release that I was describing, um, you know, you can even, we can even imagine, wow, I'm, uh, imagine that, you know, end users um, actually, you know, playing with wallets and, 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 and uh, making their own tokens. So I think that's, yeah, go ahead. Absolutely. Um, yeah. The, um, yeah. but, but but in the, in in the interim, uh, you know, so one of the one of the first sort of very very early pushes is to get the compiler from uh, the rolling contracting language down to our virtual machine, um, uh, and uh, we 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 we're, we're hoping to have uh, a tutorial on that in um, uh, come out in the June timeframe, uh, and then the the compiler shortly after that. Um, so people will be able to see exactly, uh, you know, uh, how to write contracts of, of this form, and then they'll, uh, they'll be able to play, play around with it. Um, so that's, that's, that's a very early interim uh, um, drop, and then there'll be lots of other drops along the way. I, I guess there's, there's sort of two competing, uh, not competing, but just natural philosophies or, or around building a large system one is sort of you you build a component and you try to build it as perfectly as possible uh put perfect unit tests around it and then you build the next component on top so that's one kind of philosophy and the other philosophy is that you build sort of end-to-end -end working behavior across many components mm -hmm. and we're kind of in the middle of that in in our in our thinking <coughs> so that's actually a really good and healthy tension to have uh, through through software to be aware and keep driving the end-to-end -end behavior, but also having very solid um, components with you know a, a clear separation of concerns and that that kind of thing. Well, one of the nice things about um, this slide is I, I think of it as um, dependencies in terms of developer access. That's kind of the way I, I think about the the. Um, the orientation of the slide that, that, or the, the architecture that you're talking about. So it's, right, so what you have near the top, you have sort of the, the node API and the language bindings. So um, from the point of view of um, an end user, for example, language bindings are less important and the node API is less important. But from the point of view of a developer, um, these are sort of the, their, their entry points, right? That's that's how they're able to enter into um, 
uh, interacting at a development level with the functionality of the uh, of the um, the the basic uh, system services of a of a node. Um, uh, I, I think, I interestingly, also, um, you know, you've you've got it nicely uh, wrapped up. Uh, I like the color coding so that so that we can kind of see um, what are the different um, uh, execution dependencies or environments. All right. So for you, uh, and again, jump in if I've got this if I've got it wrong. But, but the, uh, the the row execution um, uh, environment is going to sit nested inside the JVM environment, right? So everything in orange there is, is uh, 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 the row execution environment, which means it, it actually depends upon a bunch of, a bunch of things. In particular, it depends on the, the row VM, but it also depends upon um, a kind of common runtime uh, that will be accessible. An example of a thing that's in the common runtime is the tuple space semantics that we've talked about a lot um, in the past. So there's, there's, there'll be a high speed implementation, a high performance implementation of a tuple space uh, that's a fundamental um, to the RoVM execution environment. And then that will map onto lower level dependencies um, and that uh, forms the basis of the data abstraction layer. Um, now, one of the things that, that distinguishes us from Early, uh, projects or, or efforts uh, earlier on in the last decade um, for kind of using tuple spaces is that we have a nice uh, uh, monadic semantics um, and that that fits into um, uh, just the organization of the language itself um, but also it fits into the way we we um, expose language bindings um, and that's why one of the first language bindings that we provide is um, Scala, but because we provide it Scala, uh, via Scala, that essentially gives us hooks into all the JVM languages. Um, and I think that's, it, it's, it's important to note that um, almost from day one, it will be possible um, to write applications that use uh, the functionality of our components with any of your favorite JVM languages. Now, it's, it, to me, this is such an interesting um, sociological I mean uh, just a quick digression here it's an interesting sociological um, thing uh, because a lot of the cryptocurrency space is sort of Python oriented or oriented towards um, uh, language or JavaScript uh, oriented they're not oriented to some of the more mainstream languages uh, and in particular uh, there is somewhat light on uh, the JVM. I mean, there are some JVM implementations um, of, uh, of the Ethereum virtual machine, for example. Um, but uh, uh, this is not right at the center of some of the, the cryptocurrency uh, space. Uh, and so we, we, we're making a conscious and deliberate choice here. Um, this largely has to do with uh, wider adoption, more mainstream adoption on the one hand, um, and uh, technical, superior technical support on the other for the kinds of architectures that we believe are scalable. Um, so, so in particular, um, the uh, a functional language um, is going to be a better choice in terms of the longevity and maintainability of the code move, uh, going forward and also aligns with our particular uh, choice to provide uh, monadic APIs to all of the uh, comms, um, uh, data storage, and collections um, uh, with both within the contracting language and at the language binding level. Let me stop there and just check in. Did that, did that make sense, Ed? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It all, it all made sense. Uh, you know, oh, every, good. You know, every time I look at these layer cake diagrams, you know, A, uh, just kind of to remind myself, but to remind everyone that, um, you know, when you abstract things, um, they're not going to be that perfectly precise. And so, you know, the only time you get perfectly precise is like uh, the dependencies down at the code level, right? Which, which yeah. are, are then harder to understand perhaps. But so, um, but I, I realized a couple, there's, there's a couple minor things um, in this diagram that I might as well ask now is, um, 
you, you use the phrase uh, row execution environment uh, as if the row VM is sort of um, re re redundant with execution environment or actually because there's, and I know we've talked about this before, but the, the row VMs are small things that come and, and leave existence all the time. And it's so that it's really an execution environment that's spinning those up and, and, and destroying those as needed. Uh, yeah, so so for sure, you, you you definitely want to do resource management around um, uh, spinning up and uh, destroying those. But then, as I mentioned, there's a kind of common infrastructure. There's a there's a, a common runtime that each of those um, uh, VMs depend upon. Yeah. Uh, right. And but, and yeah, go ahead. So would you would you prefer this be be reworded to call it just the row execution environment? No, I think it's fine to call it the Rovi. I mean, I, I don't think we need to really re rework the. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I think the the language is fine, and it, and it's commensurate or, or consistent with with okay. uh, uh, other, you know, like you know, CLR and, and CLI and uh, those those kinds of things. Right? Yeah, and then and then perhaps this uh, this JVM uh, box ought to be behind um, a lot of this other things because all the Scala work is essentially. Um, you know, b behind it, right? Uh, I mean, what, yeah, I mean, it, yeah, I, 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 I don't know if I would, I would mess with it all that much. You could certainly do that. Something like right? that. Yeah, that, that's, that's, that's more reasonable, in fact. Okay, um, I'll, uh, I'll tweak it. Um, and then the other, question, the other question I had was, um, if the Node API really is on top of the language findings. Um, that's that, that that's a great question um it, every no, so 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 here's one of the examples where uh, that that is a uh, tests and probes that kind of assertion because you, you could say that anytime you have um access your your access is always going to go through some language right yeah um so that's 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 a a um uh, so, so that would make the short answer to your question, yes. Um, how, however, there's a, there's a longer answer that, that we can that exposes some of the subtleties. So, for example, we could imagine, and, and I provided these kinds of APIs for other systems before, that there's an access through uh, communications layer. So you, yep. you, could, you could imagine that you, you provide access through the, uh, the Rabbit uh, or, or AMQP or, the, or whatever our messaging layer is. Um, <clears throat> uh, in which case, an application can write in whatever language they want as long as that application has a binding to the AMQP libraries. Yep. So a, a Node.js um, writer could, um, could engage with um, with our node um, by sending messages over AMQP and uh, and because there's there are several bindings for node.js and AMQP um, they could they could write like that a Python uh, application developer could go in through our our, our uh, rabbit um, or, or come in through the door through through an AMQP uh, but they're writing in Python and this is in fact one of the ways that we can provide uh, additional coverage of the major languages uh, uh, be, uh, that are used in the crypto space out beyond um, uh, what's uh, the direct language bindings that are provided uh, for all the JVM languages. Exactly, got it. So, um, well, you mentioned RabbitMQ, but in our previous conversations, I thought we had settled on zero MQ. Is that still up? Near. Yeah, no, I, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm, you know, giving that decision to <laughs> whoever the comms team is. I, okay. I, I, I use Rabbit kind of as a, as a proxy for, you know, AMQP. Okay, um, got it. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, you know, uh, perhaps I'll, I'll draw a, a line out of the, the comms or what, what I'm here is called P2P uh, around up to show that that can also be used for decentralized application. That, that's that, that's that's exactly right. That's right. And then, of course, there's another obvious one that most people are used to, right? So nodes should have uh, an HTTP interface, right? So they should have a, a RESTful or not necessarily RESTful uh, interface, depending on how much state there is. 
Um, yeah. yeah, and the way state is managed. Um, but 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 there should be a set. There should be a way to send HTTP requests in uh, and get uh, re HTTP responses back and have that give at least some useful subset of the node semantics. Um, so again, one of the things that does is that allows us to extend the reach of um, uh, the, the bindings so that you know, people um, don't have to uh, come, come in through the, the native language bindings. Exactly. Um, Got it. Yeah. Yeah. So, the, so just to be super clear, there's there's a there's a lot of um, fine grained control that is available in the native language bindings, uh, and that that gets it's just like next to impossible to provide um, through these other uh, access mechanisms. Got it. Yeah. Cool. Um, yeah, another thing to point out about this diagram, um, uh, in blue, all the, uh, all the um, internal processes that are written in Rolang, um, in a sense, they're all smart contracts. They're all system contracts. The data abstraction layer is a system contract. Uh, Casper consensus is a system contract. And even the API is a contract. What's... Um, what I mean by system, what I meant originally by systems contract in here are things that are doing, you know, the, um, uh, the, the work that's sort of more specific about blockchains. Uh, uh, in, in other words, uh, token management, token to, um, uh, to phlogiston, well, that's going to be compiled, but uh, um, uh, node reputation, and, and, and we have a, a bullet list of some other things. But but just as a, in a sense, all the blue stuff are system contracts, meaning that they're required for the system to run. Yeah, I, I would want to um, elaborate on that position a little bit uh, and, and think about functionality as having kind of a, a lot of functionality that goes to uh, um, components that are, are below the row VM as having two faces. Right, so, so let, let's give an example of the, the data access um, uh, um, chain of dependencies. So when we're talking about data access, uh, let, let's say that there's local storage um, through Mongo, when that's you know, our current design. So the local storage goes to Mongo, and so there's, a, there's a, a Mongo daemon running, and at the same time there's a, um, which is, which is prov mediating some access to the uh, storage. But then there's also um, the, the Mongo library, uh, which is um, provided via some language binding. In our case, it's, it's through the, the Scala Mongo libraries. Now that's not um, what I would call a systems contract, but above that, there's the tuple space layer. Uh, and then above that, that's poked through into Rolang uh, in terms of, of either language features or contracts that utilize those language features. And so the contracts, the, the system level contracts that utilize those uh, um, language features and provide the, the sort of the programmable API that we hope people target, um, those are what I would call the systems contracts. Yep. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so actually if, uh, if, we, if we look at, um, the alternative diagram, the, the one that I, I, I utilized in the Ethereum meetup, um, it, it's, it's, it organizes the thinking along those lines. So, so the way I think about it is in terms of the dependency chain of contracts. Um, yeah. yeah, I'm and, sure. Uh, right, yeah, exactly. And so, so uh, again, this is, this is a part of my um, desire to think about it in terms of end-to-end -end behavior. So if, if the end goal is to talk about, you know, a wallet contract and a token contract and pushing uh, tokens uh, 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 into different wallets uh, as a part of some exchange, if that's, a, if our, if that's our sort of hello world application, um, then those should be user level contracts. And then those user level contracts are now going to depend upon some other contracts within the system. So we've mentioned a few of those. The, 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 um, uh, they will depend upon some data abstractions and some communication abstraction contracts. They'll also depend upon the consensus uh, contracts, so the Casper contracts. Um, and those then, all of those will then hit 
uh, on the uh, the row VM, right? And then the row VM is going to is really just a, a, a thin layer. Uh, it's it doesn't it doesn't exist as its own virtual machine, right? The row VM is uh, compiled down to the Rosette VM uh, together with uh, these built-in libraries, so the tuple space library, the storage library, uh, the comps library, and the, these sorts of things. So, so that's kind of the path downward. And once you hit comps, then you can go across the wire to, to, um, uh, to the comps layer on another node, and then that behavior percolates back up uh, that same that same stack until you get to um, behavior that's observable at the user contract level. So that's kind of the, the map that I keep in my head. I'm just constantly thinking about, you know, what's necessary for, you know, for the, you know, user experience over here to impinge upon user experience over there and then, and then vice versa. Yeah, so maybe um, first thing, I'm, I'm making this super large just so people have an easy time reading it uh, at first. Uh, okay. So All maybe right. the first thing to do is to talk across these uh, intermediate milestones. And again, you can think of these as, uh, builds, um, but the, you know, they may not be uh, a, a release per se in the sense that, you know, we're going to support it uh, at, you know, in that version and we're going to provide, you know, upgrade compatibility from version to version and those kinds of things. But there'll be a milestone that'll be really meaningful. They'll include, a, you know, a demonstration, you know, to say, uh, uh, you know, we're we're, we're good at achieving what we set out to do. Uh, we have these known issues and we're going to move ahead to the next milestone objective. Yep. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Very nice. I think the other, the other thing I, I would say though, is that we both uh, welcome and encourage feedback. So, so one of the ways that, that we're, we're expecting the thing to get better is that members and other people who are interested in the art chain technology, pick up these drops and play with them and give us feedback. Yep. Um, now that that's, you know, that's, uh, and it serves multiple functions, right? One is, you know, if someone uses it in a way that we hadn't thought of and, and, and exposes a, a bug in the execution or the implementation of the, uh, uh, of the, the architecture and the, the, the formal spec, um, that's all good. Right. And that's what we want. We encourage, heartily encourage that. A absolutely, and yeah, that's that's already occurring. Uh, for example, around the Rosette VM, you know, for yeah, that's right for people who have the interest in that, that's ready to um, to stand up and to uh, run the repo and so forth. Exactly. And so the rolling yeah. the rolling spec has been out for many months. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, 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 the other side of this also is that we we believe that it's kind of an education and marketing effort. Right. So in, in the extent to which people do engage or, you know, I mean, the, the way I see, see these kinds of information dissemination processes is that, you know, people who have motivation for whatever reason, they go and get their hands on on the bits and then they can kind of explain in their own words and in their own way um, how the thing works. You know, these th this is how it works right now. These are the gotchas. This is my experience. Um, and they provide value to the community in that way. Um, and the community then becomes, the, it, it's, it's, a, it's also a part of the due diligence process. So education do, and due diligence go hand in hand. Um, and that also fits with our decentralized um, approach to things. We very much want people to have their own voice to, to talk about, well, this is my experience. This is how I think it works. And, and I think that this is, this is the way that, that a, a wide variety of people within the community can can sort of, you know, carve out a niche uh, within the whole ecosystem. Um, uh, you know, let's say that someone uh, becomes an expert on the Rosette BM, right? Then they can they can provide value to the community by being able to um, talk about issues uh, around or limitations or or or, um, or uh, advantages of the of the Rosette BM. Another person may dig in and become quite. Um, uh, expert with the phlogiston pricing schedule right how how much how do you how does the conversion from rev to phlogiston work uh, when you're executing uh, rolling contracts so someone who has that kind of uh, deep knowledge um, becomes a value valuable member of the community and also educates the community so all of this 
the early drop, early engagement um, capability provides uh, lots and lots of, of uh, different features and functions as, uh, in terms of community engagement. Absolutely. I was just thinking of DevOps as another example. You know, this, uh, De DevOps on, on a development team is highly valued and really helpful for the entire team. You know, getting, uh, um, in addition to the, the builds and uh, automated regression test framework set up and code signing and all this other kind of stuff that uh, DevOps does, um, it's, it would be so appreciated um, to, to contribute in that way. Yeah, absolutely. All right, well, I, I'm sorry to keep interrupting. Why don't you, why don't you drive ahead? Oh, okay, um, I was waiting for you, but that's, that's cool. So, so across the, the top, um, uh, and, and this, these may change in scope a little bit as, as we talk through them. Um, you know, these conversation takes hours to get through uh, uh, when we go, start going through the rows. But at a top level, um, you know, we're, we're putting together uh, Rolang uh, to do a source-to-source -source compiler to Rosette VM that's in the works and well, well along, uh, as well as a simple REPL. Um, you know, I think it's, it's too early for me to put dates along these lines, but, but Greg, feel free to, to chime in with uh, roughly. Well, well, like I said, I don't, I don't want to tie the co-op to specific dates yeah. at, you know, in this communication, but but certainly there will be a tutorial uh, available for people who want to, uh, you know, engage early in the kind of June timeframe. Uh, okay. So, yeah. And then, uh, then um, there'll be a clean room implementation of the row VM, or excuse me, of Rosette. The Rosette VM. Yeah. Yeah. So just to, just to add some fl flesh to that, currently we have a C++ implementation and we're doing things backwards. Right? <laughs> we're going from the C++ implementation to a Scala implementation. Um, and and for for specific reasons around uh, the correctness uh, and maintainability of the code. Right. So the um, the the RBL or the 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 bytecode language is the same. Uh, so the Rosette base language right. is um, uh, is a layer above um, the Rosette VM bytecodes. So the, there's a compiler from that. That's why it's called the source to source compilation. So if we get really, really technical about this, um, uh, this uh, we're, uh, we're ultimately going to produce a compiler that goes straight from Rolang to um, the Rosette VM bytecodes. Um, and, but we're doing this in stages. So first we go from Rolang to the Rosette base language. And then we use the compiler, the existing compiler that goes from Rosette base language to um, uh, the Rosette bytecode. Um, and when you when you comp when you compose those two, right, you get you get a compiler um, that goes from Rolang to uh, the Rosette bytecode. Um, but we're um, we're factoring that into two um, first to accelerate um, or optimize along. Um, um, uh, testing, so uh, it's a lot. It's a lot easier, a lot faster to do the source to source, um, and um, and then people can play with it. And while they're playing with it, we can then kind of um, both get get the um, the the Rosette uh, virtual machine over into Scala, and at the same time, we can be uh, optimizing away the source to source, so we go directly from. Uh, Rolang to the Rosette bytecode. Got it. And the intent that that will be all completed by the end of M2. Yeah, yeah that's the idea. Okay, yeah. got it. And then uh, I listed uh, built-ins. I'm referring to uh, Java libraries or other foreign function libraries that uh, we need um, that, you know, might not be written in Rolang, you know, um, uh, perhaps some uh, date, time, stream manipulation, math, uh, cryptographic functions, and, and uh, a, a short list of file I/O, net I/O things that we need there. Yeah, that's correct. Um, and then uh, the next one, peer-to-peer -peer storage and data abstraction layer. Um, I probably should put the word tuple space in here as well. I suppose. Uh, you can. I mean, the the tuple space uh, the tuple space has to be done. Uh, effectively by M2. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, so because otherwise the compiler doesn't work properly. 
Okay. Right? It's, it's rosette plus tuple space that gives you the proper target for the Rovium compiler, Rowline compiler. Got, got it. But at, at this point at M, M3, uh, we'll have uh, multiple nodes and, and local storage. That's right. Although you, even though you have multiple nodes until you have Casper, which is M4, they don't necessarily have a decentralized mechanism by which they can agree on which transactions have happened. Before we talk about um, the consensus and the token, the Rev token, um, uh, I, I wanted to mention that the M5 system contracts are actually system contracts are going to be released all along, right? There'll be system level contracts that that provide um, the mediated access to uh, external resources, uh, like you know, uh, file storage, uh, net IO, and that kinds of things. Um, yeah, should probably get rid of F uh, or M5 then. Uh, well, no, because there will be system contracts that are. Uh, yes. that are uh, yeah, that actually do deserve their own drop <laughs> um, there's just there's stuff that's that's scattered along the way and then there's then there's a, a bunch that do deserve their own drop okay. um, and then um, and then uh, one of the things that we, we didn't so, sort of drive into is that it, in M4 um, once you have the consensus um, algorithm in place so this is a, our version of Casper um, which uh, has not only the sort of vetting cycle um, calculations that we talked about that we've talked about for a couple of years now, but it also has the maximally consistent subset. So our block sizes are not fixed. Our block sizes are are um, described by rules that uh, say, or uh, uh, yeah, rules is probably the simplest way to describe it. Rules that say what block, what transactions are allowed in the block, um, and then when when there are uh, when there's a sort of disagreement on the rules uh, as to what's allowed in the next block, then they they sort of they bet on refinements of the rules to get the the largest amount of block uh, of transactions into the block that um, uh, that that's backed by the most stake. Um, so that's that's our version of Casper. Um, and then uh, once you have that in place, then you can have um, you can have the, the exchange with Rev tokens. Um, so that's, that's milestone four. We've talked about milestone five. Um, of course, um, we want to be able to provide um, uh, fairly sophisticated APIs into the VM itself um, so that we can do debugging and um, uh, stepping and, and those kinds of things. Um, we should also be aware that you know um, we're we're inside a larger we're inside a larger um, uh, ecosystem here so we want to be forming partnerships with existing tool vendors um, so that uh, these kinds of apis conform to the requirements like uh, i'm not saying that this would happen but but were it to be the case that uh, rolang were a um uh, a Visual Studio supported language, then the row VM APIs would have to conform uh, to Visual Studio access so that people could use the Visual Studio debugger. Or if we, we made a relationship with IntelliJ so that, um, so that row VM was um, supported, or row lang was supported in IntelliJ. Then again, we'd, w we'd want to um, work with them to make sure that the row VM APIs um, uh, were friendly to their their environment so that developers can be stepping through, um, uh, stepping stepping through code in in uh, in Rowland contracts in that way. Right. I, in go this, ahead. In this, uh, you know, we we wouldn't have to work with you know, for for example, um, um, uh, NetBeans uh, owns IntelliJ, if I remember right, or um, IBM or Microsoft on these integrations. Those could also be written by third parties. Um, Agreed. Absolutely. Yeah, we heartily encourage people who want to go down that path. Yeah, <laughs> if, uh, maybe and maybe even with bounties or some such. Absolutely. So if someone if someone uh, listening, um, you know, has experience integrating with one of those IDEs, let us know. It'd be great. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, so uh, so uh, why don't remind me what we what we discussed? Node APIs refers to. 
Uh, Node, Node APIs, uh, actually, it may be very similar, but I'm thinking of like uh, Geth or, or, or uh, Bitcoin Core and um, how that those can be called, for example, on command line interface or, um, or to write a transaction, um, you know, a, a, against those, you know, send a five ether from address A to B in a command line mode. Or, I see. Yeah, or it might be, uh, you know, give me a new wallet, or it might be um, uh, uh, say, uh, um, save, my, uh, save, save my local state, or it might be something like that. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. I, 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 dump the, I get it. Dump the database, restore the data, whatever the right uh, primitives are up at that level. Yeah, okay. That, 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 that makes sense. Maybe uh, obviously, um, you know, a, a lot of this has to do with, you know, expectations, um, expect, expectations of the, the um, recipient of the tech, right? So um, some, so people who are used to dealing with um, Gath or, or uh, you know, the Omnicore daemon or, or the, the Bitcoin uh, daemon, um, they're, they're going to have a certain set of expectations, which are, are different than people who come into um, this space through Coinbase, right? So, yeah, and, and yeah, some some of those will be met, some won't. You know, so. that that's exactly right. But but I I raised that because I, I raised that point because I want to say that for the first twelve months, you know, we're largely focused on making developers happy, uh, right. and we you know, we believe that if the developer development community is happy and the, the APIs we provide make their lives easier, then they will in turn um, make other people's lives easier. Yeah, so in addition to the um, command line interface, there's also this uh, uh, HTTP and JSON, would, which would be in that Node API as well. Uh, right, okay, right. So, so, so this is what I talked about before when we talked about language bindings. Um, I talked also about you know adding uh, access via HTTP and access via some messaging framework. Um, my preference, of course, is that the messaging framework be AMQP because that's a that's a fairly well accepted standard. Um, uh, but you know, um, we there's internal discussion I think about uh, whether AMQP um, standardization is is as valuable as touted. So um, again, healthy healthy discussion, healthy communication about these these. Uh, um, technology choices, I think, is very, very important for the community. Um, also, uh, along those lines, <laughs> uh, installation is going to be a big deal, uh, and we want to make sure that it's as smooth as possible. Uh, one of the major, major advantages, you know, that in, impinges upon installation, and also this this whole API issue. Um, if we go with an AMQP provider, then there's hardly any major provider that doesn't have an external broker well, with an external broker that means you've got multiple processes that are standing up in the same way that right when you bring mist onto your machine you've not only got mist but you've also got um, a node running in the background um, so so that that installation process should be in, as smooth and as easy as it is with mist um, even though there are these additional processes that are running so in our case, since we've chosen um, uh, since we've chosen Mongo, need, the installer has to has to um, make sure that it stands up a, a, a Mongo node, and that's all um, a, a Mongo um, a broker, uh, and that's all copacetic. And likewise, if there's an additional broker for, um, for the messaging based APIs, that also needs to be uh, hand uh, you know st stood up and. Um, that needs to be all more or less transparent to the user. So to the, to the party that's installing the node, they shouldn't have to um, they shouldn't have to do much in the way of configuration for uh, a wide range of de of natural defaults, right? So um, Mac OS, um, uh, current Windows, uh, and uh, you know. Current um, flavor of, of Ubuntu, for example. Yeah, no, we'll probably use Docker as as uh, it, for the more techies. Uh, but yeah, we want to make this uh, more user friendly uh, with those uh, real installers. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so that that's uh, so 
Um, again, you know, this, this is, you can think about the march to the, that final state as, you know, you have to have a lot of um, tech savvy at the beginning. By the time the node installers are, are there, then it should be a lot easier for people who don't want to take on the burden of, of a lot of this other uh, technology to understand it, to just start playing with the node. Um, right. hey, okay. I want to, I want to um, uh, just emphasize um, the native economic token is, you know, we've been using the, the name Rev for the primary economic token or the, the first of them. Um, uh, and so in here, we're calling it, uh, we're going to, it's going to be temporary. So um, because we don't want uh, people to be staking, um, you know, uh, <laughs> that's kind of funny that I'm using it as I'm hovering over Casper. We don't want people betting on this, uh, this token and the system until we've got some kinks worked out. Casper introduces this, uh, this milestone will release a temporary native economic token. And that will be the case all the way through the pioneer release and a little bit beyond. And then we'll then we'll um, you know make a, a code change saying that token's no longer valid, and we'll introduce the rev token in, in a milestone off to the right here. Yeah, M M fourteen. Yeah, right. Yes. Yeah. So that, that that gives us a notion. That gives us a kind of clear notion of when things are live. Right. So so the the um, uh, you know from where, where is it M four even. I I, yeah, I, I deleted I deleted M14 because I or deleted a milestone. But yeah, M14 introduces the the native or the temporary native economic token. That's that's correct. That's right. That's in the community edition versus the one that you're you're working off of. That's right. Yeah. So we should update this soon. Um, okay. Yeah. No. Uh, uh, and again, I think a lot of these things will be the um, uh, uh, they'll be available earlier than are listed, at least in the community milestone uh, links. Uh, so, for example, the native language bindings are going to happen almost immediately, right? Uh, almost as soon as the virtual machine sits inside um, Scala, um, it'll be possible to to have native language bindings. Um, so, so the, the the I think we've already adjusted that in your version, if I recall correctly. Um, but it's it hasn't been adjusted in the, the community um, milestone map so far. Uh, have I got that right, Ed? Yeah, no, I think I had some more uh, editing to do. I just edited uh, M9. It's primarily the documentation and testing of those language findings that comes along. Got it, got it. Oh, yeah, absolutely. absolutely. But yeah, I, I agree with you. Okay, cool. Um, and then, and then we, what we want to do is to make sure that we've got um, you know, si significant um, samples um, and an SDK available prior to um, uh, the, the live uh, the live launch, um, so that when we go when we go live, uh, and that's always a funny thing, right? Because it's all open source; people can be <laughs> utilizing this at any time. <laughs> um, so, but, but when we when we kind of you know anoint it and say you know this is now blessed. <laughs> Um, uh, uh, the part of that blessing is, is a, an SDK and a, a wide set of samples or a useful set of samples. Additionally, uh, part of that anointing and blessing is, is um, the software development tools uh, and support for that. Um, so, so hopefully we'll be able to have good um, uh, integration with at least one of the major vendors at that point. Uh, no promises. Uh, but this is this is on the roadmap anyway. Yeah, and and uh, you know it's been really inspirational to see the tools that have come out of the Ethereum community too. Um, so you know we may want to build some some similar things, um, especially if if um, there's you know a, a very specific kind of need that couldn't be fulfilled with a, a, a one of these IDE integrations. I absolutely agree. I mean, I think a lot of these IDEs, um, like um, just to pick one out of the hat, IntelliJ, they're, they're, they aren't um, designed, they aren't cryptocurrency aware. And there, there are definitely things that are specific to the cryptocurrency ecosystem and development um, yeah. uh, uh, experience that are different from uh, what, what is what you expect with Scala development, for example. Right, and I haven't, for example, maybe they're there, but um, 
to, to show uh, you know, the debugging in a concurrent environment or visualization of concurrent processes, that that's probably something that the development tools today aren't that great at. I, you know, I, I think that's, that's, also, that's also true. I, I think there's a, there's a similar kind of experiences that I'm, uh, I'm hoping to provide for deployment. Uh, I think we'll, we'll smooth things out, right? Because at the end of the day, what, one, of the, one of the things we want is that um, there are many of these nodes and so we have to smooth out the, the deployment experience as much as possible. Um, so, so there are lots of things like that, but we also have to remain focused. We have to stay focused again on what I was saying, which is that, that core user experience, being able to stand up a, a, a wallet and a token and, and move uh, tokens around wallets within the network. Um, I think that's, that's our primary focus for that, that release. Um, and, exactly. uh, Yep. And that, and then that's that's what's providing that that line in or out. <laughs> yeah, no, that, that's cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, these last go ahead. these last couple of um, milestones, um, you know, are not hopefully not changing things at the, the the core of this architecture. These as we're moving through these milestones, it's things on the peripheral more and more, and and polishing. Uh, so these last couple of milestones, my hope is that they'll they'll tick off very quickly um, on, on the schedule perspective. Uh, not well, I mean, yeah, I mean, you, you, you make a really good point. I'm so, sorry to interrupt, but right. like, for, for example, you know, support readiness, at least in the community edition of the spreadsheet, you have support readiness as, yep. as uh, but, but we can be laying in the, the, the foundations for that all along the year, right? Um, the, the, more we, the more we have community engagement, the more there are certain people who have certain kinds of expertise. One of the things that can happen is the co-op can turn to those people and say, when we go live, would you like to have a contract with the co-op to participate in supporting the, the bits? Exactly. You know, okay. and that, 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 can be, that can be happening over the next 12 months exactly. uh, all, all along, right? And for us to yeah, get, get our uh, GitHub and Jira issue and workflow and escalation process. So, so anyway, this is, this is pretty much a process uh, milestone. Um, yeah. And, and then uh, the uh, last milestone in, in this, uh, in this um, planning process is uh, going live with the Rev token. And obviously, then there's you know promotion and education as part of that as well. Yeah, that that, that that's right. Um, and I think I think we want to um, throw a big party. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And then and then just just to be clear, this is the this is the also the point. Um, if if not, uh, you know maybe it might be preceded by a few weeks. But the point at which rocks would be redeemed for rev. That that's correct. That's exactly right. Um, that's uh, well, well, uh, well spotted. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think that's a, that's a really good place to wrap up. I mean, I think we've been talking for a, a good while here and, and hopefully people have a sense of, of what our roadmap is and, um, and why it is the way it is. If any, anybody who wants to, you know, talk to us about it, uh, um, you know, feel free to come in through Slack. Um, uh, what are the, uh, what are the R chain uh, emails? Um, uh, you can you can reach me directly, president at uh, rchain.coop. And what are some of the other ones? Um, well, uh, I'm I'm Ed at rchain.io. Right. Um, I th those are the probably the best ones. <laughs> to, okay. To, yeah. Uh, we don't have that many more. Um, <laughs> oh, okay. Cool. All right. Well, we'll we will. Yeah. Um, uh, I think we may have uh, jobs at rchain.coop and especially for uh, language designers, developers, including Scala developers, and those that are um, uh, uh, familiar or want to learn formal methods, uh, we, we welcome those uh, resumes and CVs uh, right away. Yes, I absolutely agree. Absolutely agree. Uh, and yeah, we, we talked a little bit about that on the Hangout last time, and we'll talk about that more yep. uh, uh, next week and in the forthcoming weeks.